Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Power of Oxytocin, Discovering the Breakthrough Hormone Essential to a Happy Home and Relationship. I'm Brian Post, and joining me is Helene Timpone. So, Helene, Good thank evening, you for everyone. Joining me. Wonderful. Now, we did this webinar presentation once before, and I think I started off by telling a story about a young man in my group home. And that young man has since gained a lot of oxytocin benefit. His, his brain is now turning on. He's much calmer. When he's challenged, he's more reflective. And I know that that is through the power of the hormone that we're going to be talking about tonight. And I am going to try to, I want to be as, as clear as I possibly can in expressing the, the, the the power, the, the transformational ability of our understanding of this hormone. I mean, there's so much research that is starting to come out now talking about oxytocin. I was first introduced to, to the hormone oxytocin through Susan Kachinskas, who's the author of The Chemistry of Connection. I've got a slide here later. I'll show you the cover of the book. Um, an excellent book. It's the, I think it's the, the Essential Layperson's Book to Oxytocin. And Susan has studied oxytocin extensively. She and I are actually co-authoring a book called Oxytocin Parenting, which we hope to have finished by the end of the summer. And also, we both have learned a tremendous amount from, I believe, the, the mother of oxytocin, who is Kirsten Moberg. She wrote a book called The o Oxytocin Factor. And it's a very, very powerful book. And so. This evening, we are going to get into talking about this hormone, why it is so important, not only important, but it is absolutely critical to our understanding of relationships and our understanding about parenting challenging children, children with, with the range of diagnoses, not just children diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, or PTSD, or whatever it may be. But even children diagnosed with, oxy, with, with autism and Asperger's and, and the individuals with schizophrenia, oxytocin is the anti-stress hormone. And so it's very important as we start looking at that. And we're going to get into looking at the brain here, make sure I've got everything going. It's very important that we understand, I, I, I like to, to um, reiterate what Bruce Perry once said, that if we work with children, it is important that we have a generalist understanding of the brain. We don't have to be neuroscientists. I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm just a clinician, a social worker, and I've got a social worker's knowledge of the brain. And I think that that is really all that one needs, especially if we're clinicians or parents. If we just have a basic understanding, it can change so much of what we do in our day-to-day, moment-to-moment relationship interactions with our children, especially as we're working to help those children heal their trauma. So I'm going to go ahead and start tonight by talking a little bit about the brain. And I'm also, I also want to try to pull it in in the capacity and combine it with the, the, the dyadic aspect of it, because this is not just an experience that your children has. Oxytocin is considered the anti-stress hormone. So it is a hormone that is essential to the calming of stress for everyone, whether you, you are a baby or whether you are 90 years old. It is an essential hormone, and I believe that over the next 10 years, the, the study of this hormone is, is literally going to revolutionize education and mental health and parenting approaches. Because once you understand it, it's, it's almost impossible not to see how it plays out in relationships. But I want to talk about the, the basic areas of the brain that are involved in love and attachment and in social and emotional relationships. And the first I'm going to start out with is talking about the amygdala. The amygdala is, is, is at the, it's based at the brain, at your brainstem level, it's right above the brainstem, and it is considered your primal brain. 
So it is your lower limbic system, and it is also it helps you along with the brainstem and helps regulate all your autonomic response systems, your breathing, your heart rate, your pulse, your pupils dilating, all your res respiration, all of those things are associated with the amygdala. Most of us understand the amygdala at the level of fight or flight, okay? and that's important, but that is, that is essentially an outdated understanding because we got that from Psychology 101 because most of our texts were written in the 1920s. Over the last 20 to 30 years, scientists have, have now identified that there is a third reaction of the amygdala, and I, I like to make that distinction between a reaction versus a response. A reaction is without conscious awareness. Okay, so a reaction is almost always going to be unconscious, and it is buried at those lower, lower limbic system, lower limbic areas of your brain system. A response is more conscious. So when you start thinking about response, you start operating up here at this level of the brain, the frontal cortex where you have the prefrontal cortex, which is in control of your thinking, your, your rational processing, and then your orbital frontal cortex, the executive control center for your social and emotional relationships. So the, the response ability is really a higher level brain function, and it requires consciousness. Whereas a reaction is a lower level brain function, and it is very unconscious. Now, when you start thinking about parenting, you start thinking about therapy, you start thinking about education with challenging children, children typically <coughs> who have had early exposure to stress, and stress is, is, can be any, any event can be stressful. Any event that is perceived by your brain and body system, your body-mind system, as a threat can be can trigger your stress response system, which I really think is a stress reaction system, but science is labeled as a stress response system, can trigger your stress response system and cause you to go into seeking homeostasis, which is restoring balance in your system. So stress can occur through any of your sensory pathways, and this is why the amygdala is so important, because your amygdala essentially operates off your sensory pathways. And there are some very specific sensory pathways that you can be aware of. The first most direct way to stimulate the amygdala is smell. So smell has a pathway which runs directly to the amygdala. It's one of the, it's one of the only pathways that runs directly to the brain, triggers your brain within a moment's time. Other sensory pathways that trigger, that trigger stress are sight, which actually has to go through seven different pathways in your brain before it, formal, before it formalizes into a thought. So you can actually see something, and it takes seven different pathways in your brain. It has to go through seven different pathways before it actually becomes a thought. That's why so much of what we do is considered to be unconscious. And then we have sound. We know that sound is online at er, as, as early as the fourth week after conception. The fetus is capable of hearing. So after sight, after smell, sight, sound, we have taste, we have touch. Your skin is your, your largest sensory organ in, in the entire body, weighs almost 17 pounds. When it, it's said that when you touch someone, it's as if you're literally touching their brain. There that, there's that much sensory experience and stimulation just through touch. And that's why a lot of children with early experiences to stress and trauma have a hard time allowing themselves to be touched. It also really plays out in sensory integration issues. Where a lot of children require different forms of touch. And then we have movement, and that's called proprioception. That's your proprioceptory system. That's any movement allows you that can create a stress response. So you just move your arms, it creates a stress response. You walk, there's a stress response to your brain. And after that, your other primary sensory system is temperature. So anytime there's a temperature change, that your body experiences a temperature change, it can create a stress response. So any of these seven pathways 
can trigger a stress response in your brain and body system. And these are almost always unconscious. You might smell something, but by the time you are aware that you are smelling something, your body has already moved into stress. When you see something, by the time you are aware that you're actually looking at something, maybe even threatening, your body's already moved into stress. Same with sound, taste, touch, movement, temperature, all those the same. The significance here is that all of these directly apply to the amygdala. The initial reaction of the amygdala is to freeze. Now, this is very important. Bruce Perry actually has a model, and I, I don't know it right off the top of my head, but he basically demonstrates through this model how the brain operates. So you have the lower, you have the lower limbic system, and then you have another higher level, and then you have a level above, above that, and then up here is, is your higher level. And he pretty much calls this the, um, the calm state. This here is the arousal state. Here is the upset state. And underneath that is complete brain hijacking. So when you get down to this level, your brain is completely hijacked. Now, he refers to these as state levels. Another way to look at these state levels is that you have the cognitive level, you have the emotional level, you have the motor level, and then you have the brain stem level, the state level of memory. Now, I hope you all have, have a pen and paper and you're taking notes. Don't try to take all the notes. Just take some, you know, I, I like to say take three or four good points and, and build off of those. So the amygdala, the initial reaction of the amygdala is to freeze. Once the amygdala freezes, then, then it determines whether it's going to fight or flee. Now what the amygdala does is it's the center of stress hormones in your brain. Your adrenal glands are the center of stress hormones in the gut. So this is where you pump out adrenaline, your, your amygdala pumps out your vital stress hormones, which eventually become cortisol. So your amygdala completes its development in the first 0 to 18 months. So in the first 0 to 18 months, and we know that 0 to 5 is the most, from conception to 5, is the stage of the most rapid brain development in all of your lifetime. So your brain is growing faster at between conception and five to and any other time in all your life. That's why those early, early experiences become so critical, is that you are, your brain is being wired during those times. When you've grown up in environments of stress or neglect or maltreatment or inconsistency, all of that gets wired into your brain, and it gets wired at this very low level of operation and functioning. Now, your amygdala pumps out these stress hormones, and it, it pumps out a stress hormone. I think it's uh, maybe corticotropin releasing factor. I can't remember which one. It may be ACTH um, that it pumps out first. It passes through the pituitary gland. It combines with another hormone, CRF, corticotropin releasing factor, and then it passes over to the hippocampus. Your hippocampus is responsible for your short-term memory. It is also directly connected to your orbital frontal cortex in its operation. So your short-term memory, it helps you to think clearly. It essentially comes in and helps you to be able to think through stressful situations. What's important there is that your hippocampus isn't developed until the 36th month. And this is important because this is no, these are normal developmental stages of brain development. So if you we're talking a normal child who comes from a relatively healthy environment, you know, you have the pretty good birth, you, you've got pretty good um, in, in utero period of time, a pretty good birth, no significant trauma, then the child comes out into the world, consistent caregivers, et cetera, et cetera. So these are normal phases. Now, if you've got a child who's been adopted, you've got a child who's grown up in foster care, you've got a child who had um, exposure in utero to domestic violence, to drugs and alcohol, uh, to depression, uh, exposure to domestic violence, then all of these, all of these points, these touch points that the child, these 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 points that the child achieves, get offset. 